Good morning, everybody. It's me, Paul, from Reporting Live, from my sofa. How's it going today? It is going pretty wonderful here. We are going to be going over day one of the Amber Geiger saga. Yesterday did not disappoint, y'all. Oh my gosh, my, I have about 10 pages of notes right here. I mean, I could write a dissertation just on the first part of yesterday morning. I've got my cup of coffee, I've got my sofa, I've got the dogs, and I have the sofa squad. So, without further ado, let's review. Okay, so y'all, first things first. The first day was interesting on so many levels. First of all, most of the morning time was spent basically going over what I consider to be behind the scenes type stuff, but we got to see this take place. So it was like kind of an, it was to me an educational experience. So if you haven't watched it yet, or if you don't have time, whatever, this is one of those parts that I'm like, definitely go back and try and watch it. Uh, but let's just go ahead and start talking about some of the key points that took place. So what one thing that they, for, the first thing that they do is she does like basically a mass swearing in of all these witnesses for the defense. And which, you know, I guess saves time as they go or whatever. So once she does this, she's like, look, you can hang around or you can leave, but you need to like, you're, we need to know how to get a hold of you, this, that, and the other. If we have to come and get you and give you a ride to the courthouse, you'll be staying overnight, you know, in the uh, county hotel. And nobody wants to do that. So that was kind of interesting. So then they start in on what I call just their housekeeping. And, you know, one thing that was going on with this is them kind of doing like this, look, we don't want to, we don't want this in, you know, or we want this held out from the trial or we want to use this, uh, you know, evidence, so on and so forth. So like one thing was over the sleep deprivation evidence presented, uh, they, they wanted to get that tossed. Now, another one, a huge point was information that had been extracted from the phone and things of this nature, like text messages, some internet stuff. The defense didn't want shown. Now from this information, we can kind of see that it's like, okay, she's hooking up with her partner. Uh, she might be a little bit biased when it comes to dealing with different cultures, things of this nature. Basically, it doesn't point her in the best light. Now, the state is essentially saying, look, this is helping us to say, well, this is where she was at. This is what was going on, you know, and there's an exchange of this information of, well, if y'all don't say this and we won't say this and da, 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 back and forth. And so you can kind of see how, uh, to me, I'm just like, wow, so the jury doesn't see this. So you see how each side is like, forming their story even more with what's going to be allowed and what's not going to be. And it always makes me wonder if after the fact, if people like say jurors can go back and look at this kind of stuff and be like, oh, well, if we had known that type situation. So anyways, let's continue. So this is going on and going on. And then all of a sudden, somebody's laptop starts playing like guitar, rock and roll, some kind of music. And y'all, I was like, I was like, I can't see this. I can't see this. I mean, just yeah, please hold. This judge was not having it, y'all. I love Judge Kemp. I love Judge Kemp. She was not having it. She's like, what is going on? Who's is that? And it was this lady reporters, I guess. And Judge Kemp was like an angry mother. She was like, you of all people, you've been here more than anybody else. You know, you should know the rules. Why is your laptop doing that? And, da, 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 da. and so she's basically telling the bailiff to essentially get the laptop and put it somewhere from her. Well, then it does it again. And the judge is like, oh, mm, mm, no, ma'am. So she's like, bring me the laptop. Bring me the laptop. And <laughs> so the bailiff brings her the laptop and she gets it and then goes with it in the judge's chambers. And I'm just like, okay. So I'm sitting here and I'm like, if I was that reporter, I would have not only crawled underneath whatever I was sitting in and not showing my face, I would have left the courthouse. I would have left the county. Quit, quitting my job would have just been a given. Abandon the laptop. It's done with. The long lost family photos in there doesn't matter. Just you don't need that thing back anymore. Because at the end of the day, I'm like, is she gonna have to go ask the judge for it back? You know what I'm saying? It's like the teacher took something and put it in her desk, and all day long you're like, am I gonna get that toy back? Am I gonna get that toy back? So yeah, that was just like okay. So anyways, so. So she comes back out, some more stuff starts to take place, you know, and in this information that's going on, we can also learn some things like, there, you know, there's no prior uh, relationship is being alleged between the defendant and the victim. Uh, the state wants to bring up the marijuana issue to basically be able to say, 
so that he's not being victim blamed and to show, look, this is why he was, there's a, a medical reason why he had marijuana in his apartment. So right before they're just like, okay, you know, are we ready to bring the jury out? Do y'all have anything else? And the defense is like, um, pardon me, I have a little something. And the defense is basically like, look, last night while the gag order was still in effect, uh, this DA judge Cruzio, Cruzo, uh, he did an interview with some Fox station and it violated the gag order. And the judge is just like, she's, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> she's just, she's done. Y'all, the trial hasn't even started. She is done. And she stands up. I thought she was going to do a backflip over the podium, the stand, whatever you call it, and just do a, <laughs> I mean, and just be like, I, I am finished with this. So she is just really can't believe it, which I don't blame her. And, you know, of course, the defense is like, well, here, I mean, the defense did their homework on this one. You know, he's like, well, here's this piece of paper with this timestamp, and here's the CD of it, and here's this. Um, you know, I also polished your shoes, and I washed your car, and I did this, and I did that. And I'm just like, and she couldn't believe it. She was like, are you serious? And so she's asking the state, basically, like, what is your boss? Are you kidding me? So, because y'all, this could be a mistrial before it even gets started. All eyes in the nation are on this trial. And you're going to go and do an interview under a gag order? Are you kidding me? You know, it's like, this kind of stuff is why I'm just like, this is why people get mistrustful of the, ju 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 the judicial system. Because this can taint juries. Anyways, so the judge is basically like, look, we're going to have to poll each juror. And so they have to take another break. And so essentially they do this. And again, she's like, I don't want audio going. I don't want video going because people will know who these jurors are. We're not doing that. We're not putting them out there like that. And so they do that. They come back and it's fine. Now, one thing I forgot to say is during her last like meltdown like at the reporter, right before she went out into the room, she was like, and why is the door locked? Why are all these people in the hallway? Why is the door locked? This is the people's court. Let the people in their courtroom. And so I just, you know, I, I just love her transparency. I love her no nonsense. I just, I really enjoy this judge. And for a case like this, you're going to need someone like her to keep it in line and no shenanigans going on in this courtroom. So let's get into opening statements. So you know, the, the opening statements is the estate goes first. You know, Botham was a great person. They show pictures of him. Um, you know, basically the, ob the obvious, he was sitting in his apartment. He was doing no harm to anybody. And the evidence will show that while he was sitting there eating a bowl of ice cream, he was basically gunned down. Um, you know, now the state goes on to say, you know, when Amber entered the apartment, uh, it must have scared him as he was getting up and he was shot by her. Uh, there's no time for de-escalation. There's no time for surrender. And one shot goes to the back wall and another bullet essentially takes a downward course through his chest, into his heart, into his lung, into his intestine. I mean, this one bullet hit him just right to kill him. Uh, sadly. Now, the state is talking about what the, the trajectory of this bullet is going to show that he was in a seated position or the only other reasonable position that he could that would explain the path would be if he was in a cowering position, which obviously the, the defense is going to, you know, not like this. But that's what the state's saying. So then basically the state's like, you know, he laid in his apartment alone, bleeding to death with his killer while she was on his phone, on her phone, not really doing anything for him. So then the state wants to reconstruct the day to show how Amber made like this series of unreasonable errors that led to Botham's, you know, murder. Her day usually starts off at eight o'clock. Now it's brought up that she's only lived in these apartment for like two months and her usual hours are like eight to four. And the team that she works on, because remember she's like on the CRT kind of elite team, it's very normal for them to apparently work long hours and overtime. Now the state goes into what was going on that day in regards to Amber and her partner, who we will see on the stand. They meet up with SWAT and they're going to essentially help them take down this gang of robbers. So they know they were going to be doing this. They're mentally prepared for it. And so the state is basically walking you through the day and they're kind of showing that once that part, like that's the strenuous part. But then after that, there is basically a whole bunch of waiting around type stuff going on. And what they're talking about is, you know, once they get the criminals, they take them to the station. So then, you know, people are tasked with having to, what they call sitting on it or sitting on them, which is, they're in the interrogation room. We're sitting out here watching the door to make sure nothing goes on. You know, we're writing up reports of the day. We're standing in line for booking with them. 
things like this. So the state really wants us to realize, like, look, she hasn't been out on her feet all day, you know, playing cops and robbers. You know, the, her latter part of the day has been pretty chill, for you know, as chill as that could be, I guess. So now essentially they walk us all the way through this until she gets back to the substation, I guess, which is like her place of where, where her substation is. She clocks out at 945. And then the text messages between her and her partner, Riviera, uh, become kind of, you know, irrelevant. And so at this point she's walking out the door and she texts Riviera some kind of picture, I guess, and she's like want to touch and yeah again these text messages y'all i mean not to say that any of us don't have scandalous stuff you know but it's just like i mean oh my gosh so they'll get into that in a little bit so you know the state presents evidence about how she's been intimate with her partner and that's been going on and they show that around five o'clock that day they had started texting with one another and basically the state showing like look she wasn't going home to relax and you know have the evening off she was going home to like you know get busy and the state alleges that the text show that he was going to come over and they basically talk about like how worked up they were and i mean these are pretty kind of scandalous these are as i call them you know a little bit of uh, Randy messages. Now at 9.38, Martin Riviera calls Amber and talks to her all the way until she gets to the garage at her home. She pulls over in the parking garage at some point and continues talking. And now knowing what we know, I wonder if she was sending some kind of like naughty picture or something like that and that's why she pulled over but um so the conversation ends at 9 55 and at this point Botham has three minutes to live. So she returns, she goes to the goes to the parking deck, she parks in the wrong parking deck, backs into a space, and the state's basically like, look, you can see that this is a completely different floor. It's, it's an open, you know, rooftop, and, you know, there's just, it's totally different perspective. This should have been her first clue that, wait, this isn't right. So she uses her key fob to get into the hallway, and he says, you know, she has to walk this long distance to get to her apartment. She has to walk past 16 different apartments and never notices the number four on all of them. He talks about the floor mat differences. She didn't have one. He had a bright red one. Now he talks about that her neighbor on her hallway has like this big decorative urn and you know obviously that wasn't there because she was on the wrong floor. And the state says that it seems that he didn't lock his door and basically it, it, there's a possibility that it was not completely closed. So the state alleges that one of two things happened. They say number one she immediately assumed that there was an intruder and decided to go in and engage. Or she failed to recognize that she forgot to lock her own door that morning and walked into Botham's apartment. So, I mean, if you do look in that context, because essentially no one's, it seems that no one's really disagreeing that she put her key in the door and it opened. You know, something took place there. I mean, I guess they don't 100% know. We'll see some more of this evidence come out. But, you know, and that really is what it comes down to. Okay, so the door opens. So you either open the door and immediately, oh my gosh, there's an intruder, let me engage. Or, you know, oh, I forgot to lock my door this morning because when it, you kind of freak out if you're like, well, that's weird. You know, why did my door just open? Or I don't know. So now on Reese from Toxic Bliss brought up this point too, that she was supposed to have maintenance worker work done that day. So now granted 10 o'clock at night would be a bit much if somebody was in your apartment and doing that. But essentially, it's kind of like, well, what would she have done if she had come home during the day and the maintenance guy had been in her house? You know, I mean, is that like her natural reaction right there? So it's a good question to ponder. Now, this is where the state alleges that she departed from her training, which is you're supposed to take position of cover and contain that individual, call for backup, yada, yada, yada. Basically, you're not supposed to just pull a gun out and start blasting people away. Now, the state also goes into all this other stuff like, look, the apartment's completely different from hers and she didn't pay attention to this. You know, he's like, she, he was messy. She wasn't. He smoked weed. His apartment smelled like it. She didn't. Hers did not smell like that. So all that goes on. So they want to play the 911 call and they're going to say, that, you know, it's going to show that she is more concerned about herself than Botham. You know, and to me it kind of does because on this 911 call, you know, they're saying, look, it never, she never says that he was coming at her, uh, that he had a weapon, uh, you know, that he made her fear for her life. She just simply shot him and because she thought it was her apartment. He says that on the phone call that she said, I thought it was my apartment 19 times. He says he doesn't know if she offered CPR, but that should have been done and she should have offered some comfort as well. At 10.02, the state says that while she's on the phone with 911, she's texting her partner, Riviera, I need you, hurry, I effed up. And then the state says when the police arrived, she wasn't in there helping Botham, she wasn't in there being with him, that she was standing outside. And the state also says that she erased a lot of text messages uh, from her phone the day after the event. 
So let's go ahead and jump into the defense. The defense states the obvious, you know, this is a tragedy. It says that this is basically the perfect storm of circumstances that all came together to lead to the tragedy. And the defense says, you know, we're going to spend days deciding what happened in seconds. This was a rush to judgment. And I'm like, well, isn't that ironic? <laughs> I'm just like, talk about rush to judgment. My good God almighty. But, you know, ugh, anyways. So he talks about how she went to an ethically diverse high school. You know, she had some issues earlier in life where she learned that police officers are, you know, they help people. So that became her dream to become one. You know, that she's a hard worker to get there. And, uh, you know, which nobody's really doubting that part. And, you know, he talks about the her partner thing and that she teamed up with him and essentially that, you know, she fell for him. He says that doesn't really have anything to do with the case, but they have to explain it. But he does admit it's a distraction. And I'm like, well, that's what it has to do with this case. Clearly, she is invested in that situation, her hookup, to the degree that she doesn't realize all this stuff and walks into somebody else's apartment and kills them. I mean, so I do think it's kind of important myself. Now, he, now the defense, of course, paints a way different picture of what a day like, what a day at work is like for them. Um, you know, you're catching all these criminals. You don't know what the day is going to be. You know, on the day of the event, they were attached with catching a gang of dangerous robbers and, you know, so on. It talks about just how excruciating this was and no one's doubting that they're doing something dangerous. So, but the defense, of course, is completely opposite of the state and says it's very dramatic. Now, he says, you know, the compartment complex is confusing. You park by memory. There's no marked spaces. He says that they interviewed a bunch of the tenants, like 90 admitted to parking on the wrong floor. Now, he says at the end of this day, she's going home yeah you know, she doesn't have plans to work the next day but he says there is no plans to meet up with her partner martin that they just engage in flirtatious behavior he said they hadn't hooked up in months and you know she was basically wanting somebody with more stability so it was just kind of a flirty thing with them now he says that there's no numbers for the floor or apartment numbers in her eyesight apparently she's like kind of short so he's saying that you know she would have to look up here to see the apartment numbers and whatnot and that's why she didn't now he says that all the procedural stuff that an officer is supposed to do that the state alleges is just a distraction and that this was you know not a police call this was a woman walking into her apartment that felt an intruder was in there and reacting it took her by surprise and he also says you know she didn't notice this stuff that was different because who does when you're going to your apartment you're in a zone nobody really pays attention we're an autopilot and he goes on to say that you know when she opened her door that she's thinking well here i am i'm in uniform i displayed my gun he must be you know he's trying to kill me so my only thing is to start shooting and protect myself and he says that the conclusions made by the ranger said that he was about 13 feet or so from the doorway when he was shot. Uh, and basically his flip-flops were left where kind of where he stood, which represented the area where he was shot, which was away from the couch. So he's saying that there's like zero evidence that he was getting up from the sofa or something like that. I mean, he's saying that what's more, what's more likely is that he was coming towards the door to be like, you know, hey, what are you doing? And when he saw the gun, he kind of bent over a little bit. And that's when she fired and it went in that trajectory. Then after all this takes place is when she realizes, oh, this, you know, isn't my apartment. She calls for help. Uh, he says it's not out of evil that she killed him. And, you know, the, the state is just holding her up to these basically impossible standards. And he says that we're going to hear from Amber. And so that should be really good. Now, the first witness of the day is his older sister, and she gets up there to just kind of paint a picture of what he was like and who he was, uh, Botham John. And, you know, she's basically like, you know, look, we spoke every single day. She was very protective over him. He was very active in the church and the choir. You know, he double majored in college. He got this internship at the company he works at now. He was super excited to be there. His birthday was coming up, and like the day of his murder, they had talked about a birthday present, and she was going to get him pots and pans because she she wanted him to start adulting and it is what it is and so then she brings up the whole aspect that he was diagnosed with adhd they gave him adderall they prescribed him out adderall and he did not like the way it made him feel he couldn't sleep you know all this stuff whatever so he used marijuana instead and it worked for him and he didn't have any of those side effects so that's why he had weed in his apartment she talks about being in total shock when she got the phone call about his death uh, she still has not been able to accept it yeah, you know, she's there. She wants closing and healing. And she describes having to tell, like, her mother. I mean, it gives me goosebumps right now. Telling her mother and the other family members and how she was kind of just repeating what she heard because it was so hard to believe. And the so then they start asking her, like, you know, okay, well, and this is kind of right before it ends, like, 
you know, did you think after meeting with the Texas Rangers and all that that he was going to get a fair investigation? And it sounds like she gets ready to say, say something that basically, no, I don't. But there's an objection. It's sustained. And so we don't get that information. But the bell has kind of already been rung on that. Okay, so the next witness to get up there is Robert Watson. And he's a sergeant with the police, the Dallas Police Department. And it, he explains his job, how he came to be there, where he's at, you know, a little personal history. And he talks about the CRT team, the crime reduction team, what they are, what they were. And he goes into, you know, the, the qualifications for it, which is like character, integrity, work ethic, team players, responsible, good report writing, you know, and these are all like requirements to be on this team. You know, and he talks about that Amber was a great fit for this. And he talks about that day where, yeah, they were assisting with some robber, you know, catching some robbers basically that day. Now, soon into this, the defense is going to do an objection to the state introducing the standard operating procedures uh, for the CRT team. And apparently there's a ton of them. And so the state's basically like, well, look, we're, we're just going to publish, you know, A, B, and C. And so they figure that out, uh, but it's back and forth for a while. And so then the state is going over, like, the rules and procedures for CRT and how they're supposed to respond to various situations, like burglary in progress, uh, a barricaded person, using canines in different circumstances. You know, and he says essentially these are like best practices for responding to these type of situations. You know, and they talk about some of them, like a burglar in response, two people will answer that type of call. Uh, he goes into what the procedures are for this, and he talks about how to handle these situations. And, and then the state's like, you know, how does the officer respond to a person in a home that can't hear you and doesn't follow commands? And, you know, you should treat it like a barricaded person. You have to notify a SWAT team over a barricaded person. And initial responding officers should maintain perimeter and block routes of escape. And, you know, it gets a little bit technical. And so then they ask if, you know, there are situations where officers have come to him and said, look, I'm just too tired to work. And he says, yes, you know, they'll ask for days off and they typically will allow that. And, you know, he's never had a situation where he felt like someone was unfit for duty. Uh, in his six years, he's never had someone he felt was too tired for working and that was a danger to the public. And that's going to become a very important point just because that's kind of half of what the defense is going with. Now, they start to go over the code of conduct for, you know, off-duty officers for Dallas, which essentially is like you're always considered on duty, even when you're off-duty, and about how they should act. And the defense objects to this. The, the jury is taken out. And this goes on for a hot minute, y'all. Basically, the defense is like, look, they're trying to introduce some kind of, like, administrative violation into the case, which isn't relative, you know, because you can kind of just point connect the dots here. If you're off-duty and you're trying to say, well, look, we're, you're supposed to follow these on-duty things, it's a gray zone. Now, the state's like, look, we're not trying to introduce, you know, irrelevant information. The state's like, you're the one to the defense that an opening statement said that she believed that there was an intruder, so therefore, she was on duty at that moment moment because basically one of the things to become on duty is like if you're if you're off duty cop and you see the commission of something except for like traffic violations and stuff you technically are supposed to address that in some way call 911 something so you're on duty so the defense kind of did that one to themselves right there so the objection is eventually overruled the jury comes back in and they they do some more housekeeping about like some phone number phone records and a timeline and the state is sen essentially saying that like look you know, uh, the defense is saying how on guard and alert she was and all this. Well, she's on Pinterest, sexting, doing this, doing that. You know, she's just kind of chilling out on her phone doing all these random internet searches. You know, the kind of like, I call them bathroom searches, you know, that type stuff where you're just like, you know, in the john, doing stuff on your phone, whatever. And the state is essentially like, look, we're going to show that she had a lot of downtime and plenty of time to relax. This is not an exhausted person. So then we get her boy toy up there. You know, Officer Rivera, Martin Rivera, he gets up there. Uh, he's been with the department for 16 years. Uh, he is no longer with CRT. He works a day shift. I imagine that was because of the situation. You know, he developed, he, you know, says, yes, we were partners. We developed a close relationship. Uh, they go back to that day. They worked together. They knew there was going to be overtime. He says that she seemed alert that day and with her faculties. Uh, they go through this whole list of things. You know, yes, she could see, she could read, didn't complain of being ill. Uh, didn't complain of being tired, no abnormal stresses, uh, nothing obvious to him that caused any kind of concern about her being on her A-game. Now, they go through this whole line of questioning about, you know, the when you arrest someone, what's the process, yada, 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 because again, remember, they're trying to prove that, look, she's essentially 
you know, not running the streets during this time. It's kind of a little bit more chill. And then they go into talking about what they were doing after this arrest, you know, when they, the detectives were interviewing the robbers. And this is where the sitting on them term comes up. You know, and he explains that basically it's like sitting outside a door, making sure no one goes in or out. And so this is where they're just like, you know, okay, we're basically doing paperwork type stuff. There's nothing majorly strenuous going on. You know, they can take breaks while they're doing this. There's a break room, there's a TV, so on and so forth. Now, also during this, they establish, you know, that both of them are like these really physically fit people. They have the stuff in common, you know, and that they exchange text messages, snaps, and provocative photographs of one another. And then the, the state, uh, you know, establishes they became uh, intimate sometime in 2017 and establishes that that relationship lasted into 2018. And they have to show tech like, and actually prove this, <clears throat> which is, you know, uh, we like this proof of things, not just saying. And so the state proves through these text messages, they're like, look, you know, this is still going on 2018, and he has to say, yeah. And so they're like, so what the defense said in their opening that y'all hadn't done anything for months and months is not accurate. And he's like, no, that's that, that's what the evidence shows. So then they also go into the, you know, the Snapchats earlier in the day, and <clears throat> you know, so on and so forth. And then he goes to their text messages and establishes that, I mean, they were basically just like sexting each other some really randy stuff. I was like, clutch my pearls, I can't handle it. So I was just like, y'all, now here we go. In all these cases, we see this just, you know, just plain Randy, you know, <laughs> stuff going on. So, you know, not to say that, again, you know, we're not all angels or anything like that, but it's just, you know, it has to be so embarrassing for someone like him to get up there and be like, oh my God. You know, but again, it's kind of one of these things where it's like, I'm sorry, this is where officers are held a little bit higher standard. And it's like, okay, so y'all are sitting here sexting each other while you're on the clock all day afternoon. I mean, really? Now they talk about the phone call, the 16 minute phone call. And the state's essentially like, do y'all normally talk this long? And he's like, no, not really. And the state's like, would you be surprised if I told you that we went through all your phone records and this was an abnormally long time for you to talk? And he's like, yes, I would. And he was like, I usually talk to her on the way to the gym and on the way back to the gym just to kill time. And I was like, I wonder if she's over there saying, so I'm someone just to kill time with. So, you know, he says they talked about, you know, did did the did the suspects confess, yada, yada, yada. And so the state's like, you know, you've been up just as long as Geiger. Did you accidentally kill anybody that day? Nope, not that he can remember. You know, doesn't remember killing anyone because he was so tired. He was unaware that she had pulled over to keep talking to him. And he doesn't remember much of the conversation except asking her about work. So I think it was a dirty phone call. That's my guess. I bet she pulled over to maybe take some kind of provocative picture. I mean, who knows? So then the state's basically like, okay, when you get this text messages from her saying, hurry up, you know, that doesn't tell you, you weren't going over there. And he's like, no, I had no plans to go over there. You know, that was, I've never been over there. never met her dog, none of this. So then the state's like bringing this up and this is another damning piece of evidence I felt. So the state's essentially like, so in your training, you know, you're trained to do emergency care. Yes. You know, what happens if you're alone and somebody in this type situation is wounded? Uh, we're trained to give a hundred percent of our attention to the person dying in front of them. And, you know, should you be sending text messages during a time like this? No, you shouldn't. And so, I mean, it looks bad because it's like, okay, you're trained to do this. And she's in here pacing out front, texting about her job. You know, I mean, just, it's, you know, it's not good. And so then he too is like, okay, well, all these deleted phone conversations, you know, why'd she delete them? I don't know. And, you know, he says, well, are our phones and crimes like this taken? He's like, yeah, not all the time, but you know, yeah, it's, it's, you know, it happens. And so he's like, did you delete all this stuff off of your phone? And he's like, yeah, I did. And they asked the obvious question, why'd you do it? I don't know. You know, I don't keep old stuff on my phone and I don't want to be reminded of that. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm sure. So who knows what was on those? So, you know, the defense gets up there and it's like, you know, did she just respond to all walks of life equally? And this is a huge thing for the defense because, you know, there's some evidence out there on her that doesn't look so great. So now this is where he goes into the evidence. He's like, I've never been to her apartment. I've never even met her dog. I had no plans to go over there that night. You know, these text messages were just flirting. And he says he wasn't near his phone when he saw it, when the uh, hurry up, I need you text came in. So when he saw that, he was like, oh my gosh, something terribly went wrong. He said on the phone, when he talked to her, she sounded like in a panic, but she wasn't crying. There's rapid speech, which is essentially different than what she sounds like in a high stress situation at work that he knows her to be like. And then the, the defense is like, like, you know, would you apply police procedure 
or, you know, deal with the immediate threat if you came home and there was an intruder in your home. And he says the latter. You know, I would deal with the immediate threat. The defense is basically trying to say, well, look, you know, it's like a luxury when you're a working officer to know essentially what you're going into. Like, okay, we just got a call for a burglary. We're going there. As opposed to being taken off guard and walking into your home and you're being robbed. So on the redirect, the state is basically like, you know, y'all have radios that are programmable. And essentially, you know, like, even if she was on a certain station, she could have called for signal 15 which is like an officer needs help it's the highest priority and the state's like telling him well you know do you realize that from when she called 911 it was like two minutes for an officer to get there because they did a signal 15 so you know they're trying to essentially say she could have done this you know she's not doing the right steps or whatever so that's what all happens there they start wrapping the day up and the judge is just like you know she's given the jury you know because the jury has been sequestered so she's going over stuff like that you know, little house came for the end of the day. And then she tells the state, you know, please admonish your boss and tell him that the gag order does extend to him. And, you know, she makes sure to paint that picture. She wants to come in this today, this morning, and start early. So she's no nonsense. I love this judge. The Sofa Squad loves this judge. Two thumbs up for her. Uh, this is a really long video. I apologize. Probably, maybe there won't be as much stuff going on today or whatever. So that being said, be sure and check out on Reese and I's podcast on this. We do a video version of it, but we also have the audio version. And they're two different sets of information. We don't do video versions for every single uh, podcast. So be sure to check both of them out. There's going to be links in the description. You can find everything. You can always want Sofa Squad wise at my website that's down here. But if you want direct links, they're also in the description. Thank you for hanging out with me. I really appreciate it. I love you Sofa Squad members. And hey, I'll talk to you tomorrow.